Okay, caveat, disclaimer. Normally, my habit in speaking and preaching and teaching is to work from as few as notes as possible. Okay, so I don't, I don't like to use a manuscript, but I wrote things out. Yeah, sorry. So, I will appear to have a broken neck for some point of today. I do, I have tons more. Uh, and, and don't judge me for it. Just know that I felt like some of the things I wanted to say, I needed to write out. Does that work for everybody? Okay. So, welcome to the first ever community leader training at Good News Community Church. Yay! Yeah, wow. You guys should all sit together on Sundays and then cheer. Every volunteer, together, one service. Sound good? So we're going to talk... <laughs> yeah. that, you're the only one who caught that. That was the irony in my joke. That was the only joke I'll tell all day long. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, different topics on a quarterly basis. We're going to be discussing some different things. We're going to be hearing from the majority of the staff. Actually, I think most of us over the course of this year... And we're going to be talking about some different topics. We're going to be training you in areas of ministry. And so I get to serve as the lead pastor here. And so I want to talk about something that's super, 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 super important for us as a congregation. And that is a subject of ambition. Everybody say ambition. ambition. Okay, someone tell me what ambition is. Drive. What do I hear? Desire to get ahead. How many of you think that ambition is a dirty word? Okay, none of you. I had a major portion of this as, oh, ambition might be a dirty word. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, sometimes we do think of ambition as a dirty word. Uh, ambition is a strong desire to achieve something. If you're making notes, this is a good time to do so. I didn't, I didn't instruct you to prepare for note-taking. Um, but I'll make all the things that I wrote down available to you via the interwebs. Ambition is the strong desire to achieve something. Uh, Herman Melville, the author of Moby Dick, said that ambition is the most secret of all passions. It is the most secret of all passions. Ambition from a Christian perspective means that our work, the very thing at which we are trying to achieve, is tied to the work of the kingdom. The very thing that we do, the very thing that we're achieving is tied to the kingdom. When we work, when we labor, when we build relationships, when we pour time, effort, and resolve into something, the kingdom gets to share that too. So who we are, what we do, and what we care about doesn't belong to us, but it belongs to the Lord. And everything that we do matters. Ambition is primarily about the future. It's difficult to be ambitious about something that happened yesterday or 15 years ago. Uh, if you did, you need to go to counseling because you have a problem. Uh, but ambition is about something that happens in the future. And as we step into the future, whatever it is that we're pursuing, whether you are single, maybe it's about Mr. Right, or if it's about the corner office at your work, or maybe it's about your well-behaved kids, Maybe if you love serving in a local church, you want to have a successful ministry. Or maybe you're just ambitious about a really long nap. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Especially after the Christmas time. Whatever it is, it matters to God. But so does the reason that we pursue these things. Those matter to God. Uh, so my question for us is going to be, why pursue ambition? And why be ambitious in the first place? Why be ambitious for the first place? And hopefully you'll understand later on as we go forward why it is we're talking about ambition, why it is that we're having this conversation, and why it matters for the church, why it matters for you, why it matters for the kingdom of God. Here's my answer to that question. Why be ambitious in the first place? Because your ambition is about the gospel. Your ambition is about the gospel. Here's that part where I said that I was going to tell you that ambition has historically gotten a bad rap. It has become an unfortunately dirty word, especially in Christian subcultures, because we've made ambition into our greediness. We've tied it to the secular workplace, and we've used it as an excuse to climb the ladder. 
We've made ambition into our greediness. It is our desire to win at all costs, and we've made it synonymous with words like burning, to describe our passion for something, rawness, to illustrate our use of self-will, naked, used as an illustration of how much it cost us, or ruthless ambition, the idea that nothing will stand in the way. Do you see how kind of ambition can get a bad rap? Okay. But that's not ambition, and that's not the gospel. One writer says this, ambition is at its simplest, it is the desire to make the most of your, uh, the most of your potential to achieve something special which would make a profound difference to your life and to the lives of others. Ambition, at its most simplest form, it is the desire to make the most of your potential to achieve something special which would make a profound difference to your life and to the lives of others. So we see that the kingdom of God is primarily not just about our relationship with ourselves, because we all understand that we are made in the image of God. Amen? Give me a head nod. Lie to me. But... We are just so terribly stuck up sometimes in our faith because we think that our ambition and our Christian life is private. Your relationship with God is a very personal thing, but it is not private. It is public. As you are charged with being a witness, you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the furthest most regions of the world. If you live your faith in a box, you are not practicing ambition to the degree at which God has called you to practice ambition. You're not exercising your faith. You're not exercising your skills. You're not exercising your gifts. You are not living up to the full potential of your God-given calling if you believe your faith to be something that is private. It's personal, but it's very, 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 very public. Capiche? Caprende? Understand? There you go. Ambition, then, is about the gospel. It is about positioning ourselves, our actions, and our motivators on Jesus and his kingdom. Ambition is primarily about three things. Ambition is about three things. It says ambition is about who you are. It's about your identity. Ambition is about what you do. It is about your calling. And ambition is about what you love. Ambition is about your passions. Um, Before we talk about what ambition is, we always have to talk about what ambition is not. All right, you ready? Okay, ambition is this. Ambition is not self-interest. Everybody say self-interest. You can buy a book right now on Amazon called Ambition. (laughs) Why it's good to want more and how to get it. Yeah, that's a real book title. That's an actual book that I read in preparation for our conversation this evening. And in this book, there are tips, tricks, and every tool of the trade for how to get more of what you want. Doesn't that sound good, more of what you want? Eh, wrong. It depends on what you want. Ooh, our philosopher, Larry Jackson over there. I was going to say philosopher, but that's not the right way. (laughs) That rhymed too much with Lucifer. Um, If we talk about godly ambition, which is ambition for more of Jesus and more of his kingdom, then it has nothing to do with what we ourselves want. Godly ambition has to do with everything that the Lord wants, the advancement of his kingdom, and it has ultimately nothing to do with us. You ever play the game chess? Anybody? Okay, there you go. I like interaction. You may may very well know this. Uh, Pawns. Anyone know what pawns are? You have more pawns than anything else, and they are expendable pieces. For what? To position yourself for victory. To make sure that the king and the queen are sound. We are like pawns in the kingdom of God. We are constantly positioning ourselves for the victory of the king and his kingdom. We're constantly positioning ourselves at whatever the cost for the advancement of Jesus and his kingdom. So that means our desire should be for Jesus and his work in the world. Ambition that promotes our interests will seek to feed the desires of the flesh. Ambition, 
Oh, man, this is why I don't ever write anything down, because I'm always going to get lost. Ambition that promotes our interests will seek to feed the desires of our flesh. And this looks like fame. This looks like success. And this looks like various forms of wealth. By the way, let me just go ahead and dispel this myth. If you listen to radio, TV, preachers, and teachers, if they tell you that God wants to give you back one billion fold and he's going to grant you health, wealth, happiness, and prosperity, by the way, that is a big fat lie because that's naturally what you want in the first place. That is you being spoon-fed your carnal desires. Like, let's be honest. If you're a man, you likely would like to look like Tom Brady and have his wealth. And if you are like a woman, I can't speak because I'm not a woman, but I guess you would like to be like Tom Brady's wife and also have her wealth. Because then you'd be married to Tom Brady and you're both wealthy and ridiculously good looking. I think I just heard someone say amen. So this is where I think we come toe-to-toe with the prosperity gospel and where we come toe-to-toe with the the kingdom of God. Uh, The prosperity gospel says that God wants us to be free from pain and free from suffering. But uh, anyone ever had children? Anyone ever bear children in here? Was that experience free from pain or suffering? I know we live, we live in a world marked by the fall. If not, you got the best drugs imaginable. But we live in a world marked by the fall, marked by the curse, and we're constantly in search of the victory that Jesus offers us. And we look forward to the hope that Jesus gives us and the restoration of all things. That one day, eventually, those things will cease to exist, the pain, the suffering. Let's think about the dilapidated areas of our life, the rundown, the relational conflicts, the poor poverty, I was going to say poorness, the poverty, the pain, the illness in the world. All of those things will cease to exist. And so what happens then as a result, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a message of hope that one day God will fully restore through Jesus his world, and his people for his name's sake so that he might re- enjoy a full relationship with them. But what happens in the meantime? You live a life of following Christ in Christ-likeness. Uh, do you know what that looked like? It looked like being despised, rejected, questioned by your own family, beaten unto the point of death. The scripture reminds us that Christ created an example for us in the way that we should suffer. 2 Timothy says that if anyone desires to live a godly lifestyle in Christ Jesus, they will be persecuted. Rainbows and butterflies are out of the picture. So, ambition is not self-interest. It is not about fame. It is not about success. It is not about forms of wealth. Let's be really honest, though. None of those things are inherently wrong. Like, some of us are Tom Brady good-looking. Some of us are wealthy. Some of us will have various levels of success. But by using our ambition to accomplish these things, those are wrong. If we're using the sheer drive and desire and the will force to build up your platform of you, um, that will fall and that will crumble. And one day you too will eventually bow your knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Okay. Paul says that we have to be on guard against these tendencies of the flesh. One way that we do this is renewing and focusing our minds first thing in the morning on the glory of God and his word. Anyone making notes if you want scripture? Okay, that's 2 Corinthians 3.18. In Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas say, We bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God. The good news spoken of here is that Jesus came to free sinners from a life burdened by joy-stealing, selfish pursuits. Jesus came to free sinners from a life burdened by joy-stealing, selfish pursuits. The good news is that by looking to the living God, our sights can be set on the infinitely more excellent pursuit of reflecting Christ to a hungry, hopeless, and watching world. The world looks to us for good news all the time. The good news is that we have actually been pursuing far too little for far too long. Especially since God's eternal glory and everlasting joy of Christ is ours by faith. We do this regularly. We do this whether we know it or not. Our godly ambition turns into doing more, being more, and achieving more for the sake of Christ. And we get out of 
I'm, I'm sorry, there's a fine line there between our pursuit for more Jesus in his kingdom and our pursuit are for building up our own platform within the platform of the kingdom. By the way, there is no personal kingdom, queendoms, personal governments, or fiefdoms within the kingdom of God. There is only one king. There's only room for one of us, and it looks like Jesus. Now, I, I, some of you might think, like, oh, why are you talking about this? This seems kind of like an elementary subject. But this is part of our ambition, to say what ambition is not. Ambition has nothing to do with your self-interest. The dark side of ambition for our own self-interest is that we have been trapped by misplaced glory. We've opted for the glory of man instead of the glory of God. Paul reminds us in Philippians 2 through 2, 3 through 4, do nothing out of selfish ambition. He also says to us in Galatians 5 that practicing selfish ambition is a work of the flesh. And that those who practice those things won't inherit the kingdom. That's when you should do your dun dun dun. Selfish ambition is a work of the flesh, and those who practice those things won't inherit the kingdom. Here is, here's also what ambition is not. Ambition is not whatever we want it to be. The unfortunate possibility when we talk about ambition is to see the good and the healing that the kingdom does, which we want to see done, right? And then try to replicate that same wholeness outside of the kingdom, like take matters into our own hands. I have a friend who's a great pastor, um, and he was in prayer for some things and wanted some things to happen. And, and this is the legitimate prayer that my friend prayed. And I'm telling this so you don't pray it. He said, all right, Lord, if you don't do it, I'm going to. What a dumb thing to pray. I can tell him that now after the fact. Um, but whether or not we pray that out loud there's probably a side of us that prays that internally from time to time. Lord, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to do my best in trying to accomplish and achieve this. Uh, my <laughs> that, that year was just so terrible for my friend. It actually ended in him almost killing him, himself. Yeah, like he almost, he almost committed suicide because he was just so beyond himself and trying to achieve the things that only the Lord could achieve that he ran himself into the ground. But... By grace, he has been saved. Amen? Uh, we can try to replicate those same things outside of the kingdom, and we can try to replicate them outside of the gospel, that somehow there's some form of better good news other than the person work of Jesus. And we also try to do it outside of the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. By your own strength, by your own skill. Like some of us have decent personable personalities. People generally like us. Uh, for a lot of the things that we do, we do not. I just saw Josh Weinbrenner point to himself. <laughs> did, I, did I see that? Yeah, maybe. <clears throat> when you call it out, you got you to gotta say something. Something like that, okay. Uh, it is, it's, it's incredibly easy. Uh, to, <laughs> I just publicly humiliated you. Uh, is that okay? Thanks. All right. Keep him humble. Uh, your, dad just, your dad just winked and nodded. Uh, I think acting outside of the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit is one of the things that we often do in trying to be ambition for the sake of the kingdom of God. Is because we do use our skills, we do use our abilities, we do use our personalities as the primary motivator for, let's use the book title, to win friends and influence people. Um, but those means by which to bring people under the umbrella of Jesus and his kingdom don't result in transformation because you are not God and you cannot save them. Yeah? Okay. So, this is not ambition. This is drive masked in zeal. That you want to move from point A to point B and nothing is going to stop you from getting in the way. That is when we try to act outside of Jesus and his kingdom, outside of the message of the gospel, and outside of the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. So what's the difference? If we're going to redeem the concept of ambition, we have to do it in the context of the gospel. And the primary motivating factor for flourishing is going to be what God has already done for us in and through his son, Jesus. 
So let's use this as an example. Social efforts, like soup kitchens. Let's say there's a soup kitchen in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And it's called Brotherly Love Soup Kitchen. <laughs> and, they're, and they're sharing all the love. That's their mantra and their tagline. Uh, love, one ladle at a time. If ministry doesn't work out, marketing definitely will. <laughs> uh, they can do good, and they can do it without Jesus. And their good work might have nothing to do without ambition. It is ambitious to feed all of the hungry and all of the needy people in Philadelphia. But it doesn't advance Jesus' kingdom if it is done outside of the context of this kingdom, outside of the context of the gospel, and outside of the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. There's all sorts of nonprofits out there in the world who raise a lot of money, who get a lot of things done, but it's not ambition. It's ambition, to say, to say the least, that we're trying to save the world by ourselves. But ultimately, if we're going to see the world saved, it has to be through who? Jesus. Good Sunday school answer. Uh, Proverbs 28.5 says this. Evil men do not understand justice. But those who seek the Lord understand it completely. Let's, let's use the concept of social justice, which is meeting the demands of an alien world for the benefit of all people. Social justice is going to be our brotherly love soup kitchen. Love one little at a time. The Bible does not say that we who seek Jesus understand justice because we're the smartest or the holiest or the wisest or the most educated people, even though that's sometimes how we act. You ever no Christians who try to create their own elitist category of somehow that they are better than others? Chances are, if you recognize that in somebody else, it's because you yourself practice that as well. Sorry, I just wanted to be the one to say it. As with all things related to the gospel, it is not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us. That's a quote from 2 Corinthians 3.5. Rather, we understand justice completely because we're tethered by faith to the one who is just. If we're going to save the world, we can't do it apart from the Savior. Because we seek the one who defines and loves justice and the one who calls us to justice because he is just. Ambition can't be whatever we want it to be. It must be tied to Jesus and his kingdom, the one who practiced ambition and completing the Father's will. So those are two things that ambition is not. Anybody else, what would you say ambition is not? Don't let this be like a weird lecture thing where I look at you and you look at me. But like, let's do some back and forth. What is ambition? What is not ambition? I think Steve had a really good one earlier today. Where is Steve? Is he with the children? What a great servant. <laughs> By the way, there is no self-interest in that. <laughs> God has created Steve a special creature. All right, what is, self, what is ambition not? What is ambition not? There's no way I just took the gamut on ambition in two statements. What is it not? Or do you need a little time to simmer and think about it? It is not fulfilling yourself. That's good. Larry Jackson, two. The rest of us, zero. <laughs> Here's what ambition is. Are you ready? We, remember we talked about those three statements. Ambition is about who you are, what you do, and what you love. Ambition is about who you are. Identity is the first step in understanding ambition. Now, again, this is a, a, this is a training, not a seminar, so I'm going to train you how to develop your ambition for the sake of the kingdom of God. I'm going to train you how to, how to develop your ambition, ambition for the sake of the kingdom of God. Why? In the words of the great Bill Hybels in Chicago, the church should be the well, most well-run organization in the world. Because it's not me in control, it's not our elders in control, it's not anyone else in control, it's Jesus who is building his church. I think it's Oswald Chambers who has a popular devotional called My Utmost for His Highest. 
we are learning how to develop our utmost for his highest. Because the gospel matters. Life change and transformation matters. Because resurrection matters. Because dead people alive for the very first time matters. That is why we're having this conversation. Because your work in the local church matters. Because whether or not you pour coffee or you change diapers or you do anything else in between, your work to the kingdom of God matters. Thanks, Anthony. I gave him the, the visual cue. We'll talk about a pay raise later. <laughs> Identity is a first step in understanding ambition. So we need to talk about how we need to recognize and develop our identity or who you are. And so I think your identity is in two parts. One, it's a person. And two, your identity is a people. Everybody say person. Everybody say people. You are a person. That's a good one, isn't it? Take that one home. Genesis 1, 26 to 27 says that we have been created male and female in God's image. And in this, God shares us a piece of his own identity. It's as if he transmits his own divine DNA into us. The Hebrew scriptures call us the Ruach Elohim. That God breathes into us his watermark breath of life. That we are forever stained by the Holy One. We are marked since the foundations of time as one who belongs to him. Ephesians 1 reminds us that it is before creation. It says God chose us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. 2 Timothy 1.9 reminds us that he gave us grace in Christ Jesus before the ages began. We were created by God for God. We have been redeemed by the death of Jesus for what? For the following. A relationship with God. John 15 reminds us that we are, that Jesus is a friend of sinners. That's good news. We have been redeemed to partner in the restoration of all things. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that we have been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. Fun story. I have, did uh, Rita Tesh's uh, late husband's uh, graveside today in Primgar, Iowa. And on the way home, I had an hour conversation with my mom. Any of you ever talk to your mom an hour too long? <laughs> and in it, we were talking about moral responsibility and accountability. And she was struggling with an ethical decision in her life. Whether or not to enable the poor decisions of others or to speak up and speak out against it. I said, Mom. Mom. In my Midwestern whiny voice. Mom. Mom. You have to speak out against this evil. She's like, yeah, I know, but it's just so hard. I said, but you have been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? That just as Jesus is going to restore all things, we are co-conspirators with Christ. We are guilty as charged. We are... Two peas in a pod. For the work of what? Restoring the world. Where reconciliation is a fancy way of saying fixing things. That God has, restored, God has equipped us and called us and positioned us in such a time as this to assist in the restoration of all things. Isn't that cool? So there's a, a topic in scripture and theology called sanctification. Everybody say sanctification. Okay, there's two parts of sanctification. The first part is this is that the Holy Spirit nudges you, beats the crud out of you, wants to tell you more about Jesus until you finally throw your hands up and surrender, right? Okay, and after you do, what happens? Through the word, the Holy Spirit, as we're confronted for the person and the work in the image of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is going to prune us from the inside out. It's going to take out, disassemble, get rid of anything that doesn't belong there, and position you to look more and more and more like Christ. But, part two, there are things that we are doing to contribute to that. This is not works-based salvation, but this is just good renewing our minds and positioning our lives to make the work of Christ a little bit easier. And so we are putting on the clothes of righteousness, Scripture tells us. 
So that means changing what we think about, changing our behaviors. That means renewing our mind through different activities, different groups of people, not having the same old toxic conversations that we're used to having, not being involved in violent and pornographic television, because those things are poisoning who we are and who we want to be in Jesus. Also says to, to have the mind of Christ. So these are things that we are tangibly working on doing ourselves, not by our, again, not by our own strength, not by our own power, but by the help of the Holy Spirit, wanting to prune more and more and more of us. Like, you don't just like sit there in your chair on Sundays and absorb all of the life change that you possibly can. No, it means that it has to, like, being a follower of Jesus has to happen every day that ends in why. There's seven. I had to go back and think about if there was a day that didn't end in why. So we partner with God in the restoration of all things. God has also redeemed us for the evangelization of the nations. He's also called us to leading others to be disciple makers, and that's the Great Commission in Matthew 28. He's also called us to glorify God. The Westminster Confession says, What is man's chief end? It is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That we find joy and we find excitement in being ambitious for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of his kingdom, and doing everything. 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether you eat or drink, isn't that a funny statement? Or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. So the second portion of your identity is a people. Everybody say people. Dave Harvey says, the individual Christian simply cannot understand his ambition in purely individual terms. Again, your faith is not individual. Christ's promise introduced us to a radical, countercultural idea, and the idea is this. The satisfaction of individual ambition is linked to our collective identity as a people of God. The satisfaction of individual ambition is linked to our collective identity as the people of God. You need a third time? Okay. The individual Christian simply cannot understand their purpose and therefore their ambition in purely individual terms. Oh. Do you ever hear like the, the statements that this is not the church, that we are the church? Is that right? Um, and you ever hear those people that say, uh, going to church makes you as much of a Christian as standing in a garage makes you a car. You ever heard that phrase? <laughs> Which is a silly thing, because I have stood in my garage a long time. Felt like a car. <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. I just made that up. <laughs> I, was tr- I was trying to uh, identify with that statement. Um, my, my friend Doc Kinzer says this. Uh, where do chickens like to gather? in the hen house with other chickens. <laughs> so part of our identity, part of who we are and what we're called to do is not in isolation, but it is with other believers. Um, another car, part of my conversation with my mom today is just, just encourage her and her always to be a part of the local church. And we had some conversations about the unethical behavior of some of the people that she was referencing. And she says, yeah, but they're believers. I said, Mom, I don't think if they, if they can't be a Sunday Christian, I find it really hard to believe that they're going to be Christians any other day of the week. So our identity is not just our own, but our identity belongs to the kingdom and to the community of faith. There's a Greek word, koinonia. In essence, it means that we partner with one another, that we are connected in such a way that we cannot be connected for the sake of God, for the hope of the world, and for the glory of Jesus. Like, we are all connected to one another. You remember when you were a little kid, and you would say to your friends on the playground, uh, maybe this was just me now that I'm thinking about it, uh, you would say to your friends, and you say, did I hear probably? Uh, you would say to your friends, uh, yeah, but you're, you're my brother and sister. If we went all the way back to Adam and Eve, am I the only one who did that? Never heard that before? You did that too? Thanks for the five of you who are unusual children. We are all connected. 
all connected. Edwin Clowney says this, the church is the forum that Christ has appointed for the community of those who confess his name. For those who confess Jesus, we're gathered together. In the church alone, the body of Christ is made visible in this world. In the church alone, the body of Christ is made visible in this world. Our identity is made up of as a piece of the body of Christ. The body is a powerful metaphor for the healthy church. Because in order for it to be healthy, every piece or portion of the body must be accounted for and well-functioning. Let's just take the physical body as an example. If one of my arms falls off right now, this one, is my body functioning at its greatest capacity? Good thing I'm right-handed, but no, it's not, because I need my left hand to, uh, to do other things, like to hold large sandwiches. <laughs> I know that's what all of you were thinking. <laughs> so we're looking for the most complete sense of the body of Christ together. <laughs> that, we're, that, we're, that we're not just individual Christians. But we are who we are because of the community of faith that we belong to collectively. Does that make sense? Okay. Augustine alerts us to the center of our human identity. You have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. This is significant for a couple reasons. First, it recognizes that human beings are made by and for the creator who is, in, who is known in Jesus. In other words... If we're going to be truly and fully human, in Christ, full of Christ, we need to find ourselves in relationship to the one who made us and for whom we are made. The gospel is the way we learn to be human. The gospel is the way we learn to be ambitious. As Irenaeus puts it, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. The second reason is because we find a picture of being human that is dynamic To be human is to be for something, directed toward something, after something. To be human is to be for something, directed toward something, and after something. I stole this last line from somebody. We are like existential sharks. We have to move to live. We have to move to live. What happens when we receive the Imago Dei, the image of God in our life? We don't just get the fullness that is God, the Godhead, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but we also get the Missio Dei, the mission of God, that Jesus is on a mission to restore a broken and hurting world to himself. So we are like existential sharks. We have to move to live. We are a body fully functioning when we are in movement together. Sound good? Okay. So ambition is about what you do. Implicit in who we are is what we do. All right, here's my question. Do you think identity and calling are different? Mm. I like the ums. Someone just lie to me and make an um sound. Mm. It's like there was something delicious like behind me. Mm. Is there a difference in identity and calling? Mm. Job and calling. Did I say identity and calling? Is there a difference between your job and your calling? I hope so. (laughs) Is that you who said that, John? Man. (laughs) I think if you would judge by my reaction, I think you'll find that I'm going to attempt to disappoint John. (laughs) Uh, Oh, that's, that's great. Um, how about this? Uh, a calling is what you want to do, okay? And a job is what someone else wants you to do. How many of you have callings? You can raise your hand, please. How many of you have jobs? Kelly, this is that song that I want to sing. Everybody's working for the weekend. Who's that song by? Who said that first? You win the grand prize. 
you get a hug from Anthony. <laughs> Anthony handing out hugs left and right. <sighs> I'm going to say calling is what you want to do. Job is what you don't want to do, but you get paid for it, I guess. Um, I don't think that there is any distinction between the two. Okay, I know, that sounds like a self-contradicting statement. I don't think there's any difference between the two. Because what we do and who we are cannot be disconnected. Because if we live and act and move in such a way that everything is for the glory of God, for his namesake, then everything that we do by virtue is a calling. Everything by virtue of what we do is a calling. Some things we'd rather not do, but everything becomes a calling. Here, here's where I'm going to like side with the sovereignty of God 101. Are you ready? God has placed you in a position in time as such as this for his purpose. For his glory. Does that change the concept for some of you of whether or not you have a job and for some of you whether or not you have a calling? Now, I was, <laughs> I was listening to a podcast some time ago that says that Christians, particularly Christian ministers, have it much more easy. That you are probably going to have a different concept in what you do and its effectiveness. For example, you might look at myself and Steve and Kelly and Anthony, and you might think, wow, they do more meaningful work in the world than I could ever do. I have to go to work. I have to punch the time clock nine to five. I've got to take a 30-minute lunch and two 15-minute federally mandated breaks. Amen. And I get to go home, and I get to try to do my other meaningful spiritual work on the side. Does any of you feel like that? Saw one head on. Anybody feel like that? Um, that is a lie. That is a lie that you tell yourself. Ambition is about what you do, and again, what you do is tied to who you are. And who you are is tied to who you were created for, who you were created by, and the relationship that you have with Jesus from now until this time forward, until you meet him face to face. So everything that we do, whether punching a time clock or whether we're being an engineer, or we work at a local restaurant, or whether we do general construction, or whether we are a salesman for a grain conditioning company. <laughs> You're the next person I looked at. Um, those things all have value and all have meaning to the kingdom of God. Why? Because you are a witness for Jesus and for his kingdom, for his namesake. Now, this is where I'm hoping for some questions. So if you have questions, you can like go ahead and raise your hand because I don't want this to again be a lecture. Okay, because I'll keep going. Okay. okay, good. Marv? Mm. Yeah, I'm going to try to repeat what you said, and I'm going to totally butcher it. Are you okay with that? Okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure in case I don't offend anybody. Uh, you said your calling is a relationship between you and God. I bet you just repeat what you said. Absolutely, because the Lord is sovereign and the Lord is in charge. And the Lord has gifted you, equipped you, skilled you with the work necessary in which you are able to do, able-bodied, amen? Anybody healthy, able to work, to make a living? So God has called you to that specific work. 
in this specific time for his glory, for his purposes, for his name's sake. So let's jump uh, to a completely different end of the spectrum on the subject of what you do and what you work. Uh, how many for, uh, of us is our work self-seeking? Do we find our work to be that of self-interest? Like, let's just put it straight and simple. You would like to make a lot of money to have a nice living, <laughs> to take care of your family, to make sure all of your ungodly student loans are paid off. <laughs> Maybe you would like to take care of your parents. Maybe you'd like to travel and see your grandchildren a little more often. Maybe you'd like to just be able to have extra indisposable income to buy random people nice gifts. That would be great. That would be great. Our work is not to function for us. Our work is not to function for our own self-interests. Our work that God has equipped us, called us to, placed us in a particular time such as this for is for the benefit of others. Okay. Your work is not just about you and what you want to do. It is about Jesus, the message of his gospel, the advancement of his kingdom, and for the welfare of others. And so for many of us who want to differentiate between the, the idea of job and calling, you have not been faithful witnesses in your workplace, and you have not been faithful stewards to your finances. Meaning, God gives us these gifts lavishly and selfishly. We've all been in this camp, I, I'm included, that I want to hoard them for myself when I should be looking for avenues in order to affect the greater likelihood of someone else's life or to look for more avenues in order to be generous for the sake of Jesus and his kingdom. Yeah? Okay, there's a second, there's a third thought that I have to this. And anybody have a, a piece of paper that you were given? Was there extras, by the way, or are they all given out? Can I have one? Thank you. So on the very back, there's going to be seven questions. If God has called us to a specific work at a specific time such as this for his kingdom, for the well-being of others, and for the glory of God, we have to ask ourselves the question, do we do our work with excellence? Oh, this is a tough one. Not all the time. So there was a time in which I worked at Starbucks. And there's a lot of necessary... This is really gross, so be mindful of this whenever you eat fast food. Uh, there would be times in which we did not do our necessary cleaning duties in an excellent format. I repent. I believe the gospel. Jesus has freed me from my wrongdoings. By the way, milk does get gross. <laughs> uh, but there was, a way, there was a time and a place in which we did not commit ourselves to excellent work. I'm going to say that there are a multitude of reasons as to why I did not want to invest in the excellence of Howard Schultz and the Starbucks Corporation. I did not have great working relationships with the store manager. I did not believe in the values and the mission and the vision of the organization. I did not feel as if the demands of my position were clearly articulated. I did not feel as if my position of a shift manager was well clarified in the position of the, <clears throat> of the assistant manager, the store manager, and every other barista that worked in the position. I did not do my job as a shift manager at Starbucks to the glory of God and to my greatest capacity and ability. So at the top of the back page is seven statements that talk about what is your competence of work. So when we reflect on the work that we do, and let me just tell you right now, this is what I'll, I'll jump back to you real quick. There's a problem if you want to say that your work that you do, whether it be here at the church or at your job, is lesser than the work of the local. Uh, lesser than the work that maybe myself, Kelly, Anthony, or Steve do. Because God is working in you and through you in your workplace in the same way that he is working through us in this place. And I think you might be having 
baptisms in the break room, if you would use that as a potential opportunity in the workplace and with the relationships and the relational capital and the opportunities at which you've been given in the place that God has called you to. We think about this being the, the lockdown opportunity for the sacred work in the world. Like, did you know that the Holy Spirit is not confined by these four walls, but he lives in you and he goes with you and the mission of God has to be accomplished in you and through you as well. Okay, so we have to answer the question of this. What is the competence of your work? Now, I want you to think about this scale and the work that you do here at the church. And if you have a pen, anybody not have a pen? Anybody promise to do this later? <laughs> what is the competence of your work? I want you to write on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being I have no idea what I'm doing, and 10 being smooth sailing. I want you to write a 1 to 10 in every single category there. So the first question that we have to ask about our competence of work or whether or not we're doing our job to excellence is am I aware of my job and ministry expectations? Am I aware of the things that are being asked of me? Am I aware of my responsibilities? And again, one is no idea what I'm doing. Ten is smooth sailing. And maybe a five is I'm just here. <laughs> I'm here because someone asked me. <laughs> the second question that you have to ask when you're talking about your excellence and the competence of your work and whether this is at your workplace or here on Sundays or Wednesdays or any other day that ends in Y, can you clearly articulate your role within the organization? Can you articulate what you're doing? Better yet, can you articulate why you're doing it? Right. Yes. Yeah, let's do it here at the church. Yep, here at the church. Did I say that already? A uh, half and half, so I didn't, I didn't articulate it clear enough. <sighs> okay, I'm going to take that down on my number two. As chief communicator, I'm a two. Oh, man. I went, I went from a 10 to a 9 on my composite score. I'm just kidding. Number three, I am given clear oversight and direction from those over me. Uh, especially here at the church, we don't work in a bubble. We don't work in isolation from other people. Chances are, at some degree or another, you receive instruction and direction, usually from like one of three groups, the staff, the elders, or the deacons. And you feel as if they have buy-in and consideration and they have clearly articulated your roles, your expectation, and the direction in which you are to go and the church is to go. Number four, I am given parameters for my duties, knowing what I can and cannot do. If we're going to perform our work to the excellence, wouldn't it be nice to know whether or not we had some guardrails? What am I allowed to do and what am I not allowed to do? What is appropriate? What is inappropriate? What is spending too much money? What is spending not enough money? Is my vision too big? Is my vision too small? Or am I trying to take over? Or am I not doing enough? Are there great parameters? Number five, I am given creative freedom to explore new areas within my ministry. I am given creative freedom to explore new areas within my ministry. Do you feel like you're a part of the team? Has your input been asked? Do you feel like you can clearly communicate wants, needs, and desires for wanting to see the work of the Lord accomplished here at Good News? Or just in any church ministry context? If you have been given the creative freedom, number six is more in line with that question. Do you exercise innovation within your area of work or ministry? Are you willing to take risks? Are you willing to do new things that have never been done before? Because again, the church should be the most well-run organization in the world. Because of who you are, who you are in Jesus, and what God created you for matters. And your unique giftings, your unique skills given to you as a part and portion of the complete body of Christ matter. Have you been given, do you exercise innovation? 
Do you change things up a little bit? Do you look for new and exciting ways to do things? Are you looking for old ways and maybe ways to expound upon them? Number seven, do you receive constructive feedback and criticism for your work? Does someone tell you after you've exercised innovation, hey, that was a really bonehead idea? <laughs> or does, or can someone, has someone honestly told you, you should probably never make coffee ever again? <laughs> no? That would be, that would be a good idea if, if that would be your ministry. <laughs> Chances are you would not be exercising the greatest opportunity for ministry in the local church. Okay, so you're going to add all those up and you're going to divide it by seven. Does anyone have a score they want to share? 6.5. Okay. So what a 6.5 could tell us is that we are doing better than average and we can work to, I'm going to guess, do you want to tell us what number you were low on? <laughs> yeah, take a risk. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So one of the things that we can do, and so Sally's a good indicator of being in a position that is in the middle of transition. So you serve... Primarily on, on the worship team, is that right? Did I miss? Prayer, oh, prayer team, which doesn't have any oversight. Ah, oh, whose fault is that? So let's say that it's Anthony's fault and you're on the worship team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, worship team, okay. So <laughs> Sally can play those keys, but <laughs> we're in a season. Obviously, prayer, need, prayer team is something we need to address in the future. <laughs> Oh, wow, let me make sure we follow up on that later. Uh, the worship team, let's say Sally has a problem with the worship team. What we would say then is that that's an area and a ministry that is currently in transition. And we hope soon, Lord willing, before the summer to fill that position to provide clearer direction because those are no longer Anthony's primary job duties. And so there's obvious areas in which we can increase the excellency of our work Or if we do find ourselves low in a particular area, this would be an area in which we would want to go to our direct report twos and say, look, I'm in love with the local church. I'm in love with the mission of the gospel. I'm in love with the ministry of reconciliation and life transformation. And I want to do my work to the greatest of my abilities. I need help in these areas. So we're looking. We have to always gauge our competency of work. So I hope that this is a little tool that you can use. These are just seven questions, and they're going to give you odd point scores. Anyone else want to share? Towered? Okay. Absolutely. Okay, so it looks like Howard already identified the steps in which he would need to increase his level of excellency in ministry, and that would be to find and to hone his particular giftings and callings. Okay. What's our class coming up, Anthony? Uh, (laughs) January 10th. It starts this Sunday, so that would be a good opportunity. If you feel like you are not clear in what you have been gifted and what you have been called into, that's going to be a great class, right, Anthony? Yeah. I'm looking for a reason to accuse Anthony of not doing great in a ministry area. <laughs> oh, what is your highest number? That's good. Good thinking. I'm always dwelling on the lows. Oh, three way. She's aware of her expectations. She can clearly articulate her role within the organization. And she has been given creative freedom to explore new areas within her particular ministries. (laughs) (laughs) 
No, because she said she did prayer team. <laughs> Brandon one, Anthony zero. I'll be here, not all week, just a really long time. <laughs> See, how are we doing on time this evening? I want to make sure that we're going to close up in a... Oh, okay. So we found at this point that ambition is about what, about who you are, that you are a person, that you're a people, and that you are connected, and that your work is not personal, but it is connected and it should be brought all together for the glory of God, for the sake of the church, and for the, for the glory of God to be made known in all the world. And we also realize that our work is about what we do and our ambition is about what we do. And so our ambition then is tied to the very thing that God has put us in the place of at this present time. So go ahead and can someone share with some of the different ministries that are involved in? Oh, no, stop, not all at once. Celebrate recovery. Coffee, okay. What? Ushers? Welcome, greeting. Sunday school, yeah. Worship team? Nursery, step in faith. A reunion? Feeding children? Reunion. Anybody else? Is there any others that we missed? We worship? Okay. All of those are examples. I'm not going to ask you whether or not you like them, <laughs> whether or not you're in love with them, because I want to change the paradigm that God has called you and positioned you in those ministries at this particular time and place of your life for his glory, and for the benefit of the kingdom of God. Therefore, he calls you not to just a surface-level competency of your work, but to complete and utter excellence. So the desire, then, in whatever you do, whether it's in the marketplace or whether it's here at the church, whether you're serving coffee or dancing and singing with children, we want the competency of your work to be tens. Tens all the way through. And if you're not sure, maybe you're just serving to get involved, we want you to participate in the class offering that we have so you can grow into the greatest giftings and callings that the Lord has called you into at this time in your life. Because here's the thing. We don't want the wrong people making coffee. And we don't want the wrong people serving our children. Which brings us into our last part. Ambition is about what you love. Ambition, says John Stott, concerns our goals in life and our incentives for... for, for <laughs> Let me start that over. Ambition, says John Stott, concerns our goals in life and our incentives for pursuing them. A person's ambition is what makes them tick. It, uncover, it uncovers the main spring of their actions, their secret inner motivation. And so when I read this phrase, I'm more and more convinced that this incentive, this incentive pursuing for pursuing our goals in life is seeing our passions at work in our life. I also believe that there's no greater satisfaction than in exercising our passions as often as we can. Does anyone disagree with that? Like, like, let's say you have a job. Like, ideally, you would like to do what you loved. <laughs> right now, we currently live in an age where the millennial generation, and I hate to use that phrase, what is it, 18 to 35 or somewhere in that range, is likely to give up high-paying jobs that they paid a whole lot of money for to do something that they love. For example, I have a friend named Chris Wells. Chris Wells has a degree in electrical engineering. I think he has a master's degree in electrical engineering. You know what Chris Wells does? Chris Wells fixes espresso machines. <laughs> Chris Wells has like $120,000 in student loans. Chris Wells is not concerned because Chris Wells is seeing his passions at work in his life. 
I'm more and more convinced that this incentive, this desire, this concern for our goals is seeing our passions at work in our life. I also believe there's no greater satisfaction in exer- than in exercising our passions as often as we can. In John 1.38, there are two would-be disciples who are caught up in John the Baptist's enthusiasm. And they begin to follow Jesus, and he wheels around and he asks them this question. He says, what do you want? This is the question that lies underneath every question that Jesus asks of us. Will you follow me is another version of what do you want? What do you want? James K.A. Smith says that our wants and longings and desires are at the core of our identity, the wellspring from which our actions and behavior flow. Our wants reverberate from our heart, the epicenter of the human person. Thus, Scripture counsels, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Discipleship, we might say, is a way to curate the heart, to be attentive and intentional about what you love. In ambition, we have to ask ourselves, what do we love? What do we want? And what are the very desires and aches of our human longing? Jesus' command to follow him is a command to align our lives and longings with his. There's a fundamental problem If you ask the question, what do I want, and it's different than what Jesus wants. Jesus and his command to follow him is a command to align our loves and longings with his. To want what God wants. To desire what God desires. To hunger and thirst after God and crave a world where he is all in all. This is a vision encapsulated by the shorthand, the kingdom of God. What do you love? This should be our primary motivator. This should be the reason for our ambition in serving in the church. Our love, our longings, should be Jesus and his gospel. We want to see people come alive for the very first time. We don't want to just see them stay alive. We want to help them see others come alive as well. Amen. Amen. That's good. Let's, let's take that to the bank. That's good. So is our heartbeat for the local church, is the work that we do, does it align with Jesus and his kingdom? And if it doesn't, what do we need to give up in order to make it that way? When you greet, when you ush, when you deke, when you eld, when you pour coffee, there's no cool shorthand of Wayne. When you pour cough, (laughs) when you change diapers, when you play Muse, (laughs) all right, I'll stop. Whatever you do, are you doing it as one who identifies themselves in Christ? that God is doing meaningful work through your ministry and that you do it because you love Jesus and his gospel. Again, we're having this conversation on ambition because the church matters, because Jesus matters, and because your ministry here at Good News matters. And everything you do plays a vital role in reaching the next person for Jesus. Everything you do helps us create an environment as if Jesus were king. Caring for children as if Jesus were king. 
playing the piano as if Jesus were king. Being injured from the drums as if Jesus were king. (laughs) Sorry, Jeff. Standing at the door and saying hello to people that you necessarily do not like (laughs) as if Jesus were king. Showing up on time and being prepared as if Jesus were king. This is the work that the Lord has entrusted us with. And so one of the sheets, on the sheet that I've given you, this is your guide to help you form who you are and the work that God has called you to be. You don't have to do this tonight. I just want you to do this in your own time, and I just trust that you'll do it. I want you to think about the work that you do, who you are, and what God has called you to. So one of the, some of the questions that are asked on the sheet is, how do you view people? Because when we work in the church, our... We typically don't work alone, but we are always involving ourselves with believers and non-believers. And so when we view our work, and as it matters to other people, how do we view people? Are they objects to manipulate? Are they who I collaborate with? Or are they here to serve me? Those aren't, there might be better options, but I think if we'll answer those things honestly, um, those will help us direct and change our competency of work for greater excellency in the church. Um, another thing that matters um, in our ministry is being able to differentiate, differentiate between the highs and the highs and the lows and the lows. So the next thing we ask are, what are the top three defining moments in your life? Chances are that you can do a really good job of talking about all the experiences that suck. Yeah? You can pinpoint the lows. But what are the def- top three defining moments in your life? I talked with one individual who is not here, who is also one of our deacons. And I said, where is the last time you saw the Lord at work? And you could not even believe like the type of perk and reminder like that showed in that individual. That they were invigorated once again with what God had done in their life. So what are the top three defining moments in your life? And the next thing... If you're unsure of where you're serving is the best place at all, find your sweet spot. So what are your passions? What do you love? What are you the best at? And what motivates you? And then one of the other steps that we want you to to think about and want you to consider, the first thing you should do before you do any of those on that list is you should go to the class that we're about to teach starting this Sunday at... 1045. I had to whisper in case I could correct myself really quick. 1045. <laughs> and then these are, these are great items in which you can go through and, and you can find your own skills and your own strengths. So Myers-Briggs assessment, are you an ENTJ, are you an LMNOP, uh, your Enneagram, what's your, what's your number? By the way, the Enneagram is phenomenal. If you ever uh, participate in an Enneagram study, do not type yourself because you will be wrong almost every time. Do it in a community and allow the typings of others and the conversations to come to be, come from your typings. Enneagram is great because it shows where we go in strength and where we go in weakness. In strength, I'm a team player. In in weakness, I am like a, I'm a dictator train wreck where I'm a micromanager. And I know that about myself. You do the DISC profile. What is your high assessment? Are you a high D? Are you a high somewhere else on the list? Strengths finder. Spiritual gifts test. Where am I gifted? Do you have the gift of shepherding? Do you have the gift of leadership? Do you have the gift of mercy? Do you have the gift of administration? And then I think maybe one of the best ways in which we can define ourselves and our gifts and what God has called us to and how we can cultivate those gifts is through an APEST evaluation, Ephesians 4.11. Most likely these are two gifts. And it says that, that the Lord gave the church to some, apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. Apostle is a nice way of saying that I have an entrepreneurial spirit, that I want to generally do new things for the Lord. Prophet says that I'm going to speak truth in the face of the darkness of today. Evangelist says, I want to see others come to a new relationship with Jesus. Shepherd says that I'm going to nurture the flock of God. And teacher says that I'm looking for ways and avenues in which I can teach the word of God clearly and effectively to others. And so most likely we're a combination of the two. And so I want to just pray a prayer of blessing over us 
as we go forward to do the work of good news and that we have reclaimed the concept and the idea of ambition, that what we do matters because our ambition is ultimately about the gospel. Let's pray. God, would you come and would you intersect our ministries, would you intersect our job and our identities? Lord, and would you call us to greater and higher purposes? Lord, would you dig deep within us and show us that the things that we're doing are already those higher purposes? Lord, the things that we are currently laboring now is for your glory, for your benefit, for the sake of your kingdom and the glory of Jesus now and forever. Lord, may we continue to be equipped and skilled and skillful in the things that you have called us to. Lord, I pray that in this group, hearts and minds were open. Lord, and we left ourselves open to wonder and possibility in which how might we grow in excellency and effectiveness for you and your kingdom. Lord, what would you do in us and through us? Lord, what might you accomplish through our meager efforts? Lord, may we continue to be pawns and position ourselves for more and more victory of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, fully knowing, Lord, that you can wipe the board clean whenever you want, as you've already proclaimed yourself victorious. Lord, what a great calling you've given us to be an effective player. Lord, we thank you for that. And may we just be given further skill and courage, and the faith to accomplish all the things that you're calling us to. And may we grow to be the best version of ourselves in you. And we pray this in your name. Amen.